many years I struggled with the understanding of how the church views St. Mary. I struggled because I didn't understand, like, why, like, even, I remember one time when I was a kid, and uh, it was during communion, and they started to sing a hymn to St. Mary, and I got really upset. I said, how can you sing happy birthday to somebody else? And I went to my mom, I said, you're singing happy birthday to St. Mary, but it's Jesus' birthday. Why are we singing to St. Mary? And it's, you know, the Lord's birthday. It's his birthday party. This is what communion is. And for many years, I struggled with the understanding of how the church views St. Mary and why she's such a big deal for us. You know, we have right now during this season of the church, we have this period where we fast to honor the life of St. Mary and to ask for the Lord to fill us with grace so that we can become like her. So what my goal is today is to tell you guys a little bit about why St. Mary is a big deal. Why she's a big deal to us as Orthodox Christians, and why she's a big deal in general in the story of salvation. Because, I'll be honest with you guys, Christ chose to come at a certain time and in a certain place from a specific woman, right? Like, she was a specific woman that he chose to be born from and chose to be the dwelling place for nine months of his life and chose that this would be the woman that would raise her. So she's a big deal to even the Lord Jesus Christ. So why is she supposed to be a big deal to me? And the goal is for us to be able to go through this together. I want to start with a quote from St. Ephraim the Syrian. St. Ephraim the Syrian says, Awake, O my harp, your chords. Awake, O music. He's saying, Awake all the potential that I have to make music in praise of the Virgin Mary. He's basically telling anyone who's a musician, grab all your instruments and use them for the sake of praising St. Mary. Lift up your voice and sing the wonderful history of this version, the daughter of David who gave birth to the life of the world. The daughter of David who gave birth to who? The life of the world. That's the starting point for this discussion today. The starting point for every single one of us is anytime you speak about the Lord Jesus Christ, it's almost impossible to not connect Him somehow or some way to his mother. Because his mother, again, is the perfect person that he chose to enter into time and space to dwell in. And in our church, when you enter it, you notice right away this huge icon right at the center of the church. You notice very clearly St. Mary doing what? Holding the Lord Jesus Christ. And in most Orthodox churches, when you enter, right on the left-hand side, when you're looking, you'll see an icon of St. Mary holding the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you guys something that maybe you haven't thought of. And even as I was preparing for this, these are things that I didn't even think of before. But when the Lord was creating the world, and when he the dialogue between the Holy Trinity is happening. And they say, let us create man in our image and likeness. And God, because he has the foreknowledge and knows all things, he knows that when he creates man, he knows that man is going to fall. Right? Like, the plan of salvation is not plan B. I want you guys to know that. It's not like, oh, they messed up, so. It's like, no, I'm creating them. I know they're going to mess up. I know they're going to fall short. And I know that I'm going to have to save them. So in the beginning, the plan of salvation is that he is going to come and dwell amongst us. And in the beginning, he knows when the opportune time and when this perfect vessel is going to be alive that he is going to come and be born of. So let me give you evidence of that for a second, that this is not an afterthought of the Lord. So when the woman in the beginning saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. We're going to go right to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. She took of its fruit, and she gave to her husband, and he ate. And the Lord said to them in Genesis chapter 2, Surely on the day, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. So he tells them, if you eat from this tree, you will die. So a woman takes from the tree, eats from the tree, passes it to her husband, he eats. They both, death and sin, enter into the world. And now... There needs to be a divine solution to this problem. Can a king create the world and leave his beautiful creation to just not exist anymore? 
No way. He needs to come up with a... He has a solution already in place because God doesn't come up with thoughts as they come. He knows from the beginning that he is going to heal and save humanity. But look at this. When he's cursing the serpent, this is actually one of the first prophecies about St. Mary. When he's cursing the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, he says, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And look at this, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Because you have done this, because you have done this, cursed are you serpent. And I'm going to bring through the woman that you tricked a seed that is going to crush you through, this, through a woman. You're gonna, there's going to be a war. There's going to be this sort of tug of war match that's going to happen. And you tricked the first woman, but you just wait. There's another woman that's coming. That's, her offspring is going to crush you. Yeah, you're going to bruise her, but you're going to bruise him, but he is going to destroy you. So from the beginning, this was part of God's providence that when he was creating the world, when he was creating humanity, he knew the plan of salvation and he knew that St. Mary was part of the story of salvation. Can you see that? All the fathers of the church interpret Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 with the understanding that it is a prophecy of St. Mary and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the early church even, they would call St. Mary as the new Eve. Look what St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who is one of the early, you know, third century Christians, or fourth century rather. As Eve was seduced by the word of an angel and so fled from God after disobeying his word, Mary in her turn was given the good news by the word of the angel and bore God in obedience to his word. As Eve was seduced into disobedience, To God, so Mary was persuaded into obedience to God. Thus, the Virgin Mary became the advocate advocate of the Virgin Eve. I love this picture. I love this picture. Eve is in a sorrowful state, and the fruit of what she has done brought death into the world. The fruit of St. Mary brings healing and salvation to the whole world. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed is the fruit that you bear because the fruit that was first eaten by the first woman destroyed humanity. The fruit of the second Eve or the new Eve healed all of humanity. And I'm not getting theological for no reason. I want us to understand this because this is very instrumental to the crux of how we as Orthodox Christians understand. We call this study called Mariology. Like how do we understand St. Mary? Even St. Gregory Nessa, he says, For different than to the news formerly addressed to the woman is the announce now made to the virgin. In the former, the cause of sin was punished by the pains of childbirth. Remember, he curses the woman and he says that you will suffer and you will go through difficulty in your childbearing. In the latter, through gladness, sorrow is driven away. Hence, the angel not unaptly proclaims joy to the virgin, saying, hail to you. So the first woman, her curse is that she's going to suffer pain through giving labor. The second Eve, or the new Eve, is going to give birth, and that birth is going to be joy to the world, healing to the world, rejoicing to the world. So why is she such a big deal? Again, because we have this understanding that the work of salvation happened at a certain time, in a certain place, and within a certain context, and this was from the foundation of the world, that God had St. Mary in mind. And I'll, see, I'll tell you guys why this is important for us. So, why she's a big deal. How many of you ever heard of Father, Father Alexander Schmemann? Father Alexander Schmemann is Dean Emeritus of St. Vladimir Sem- Seminary. He's an uh, Eastern Orthodox priest. He's a, a beautiful theologian. And he wrote this book about St. Mary that he has a bunch of really good quotes that I'm going to share with you guys in a few minutes. But he has a bunch of really good books about the Eucharist. One of them is called The Life of the World. And he has another book about evangelism and mission for Orthodox Christians called Church World Mission. 
I highly recommend Alexander Schmemann. He's a wonderful uh, theologian, and there's a lot to learn from him. He says this, It is understood that Christ's co-nature with us is Christianity's greatest joy and depth. The fact that God chose to take our nature, right? Like the, the, our greatest joy as humans is that God took our flesh, right? Like every other religious tradition says that God could never enter into, human, into humanity. It's too distant for God to do so. But because of God's love for us, he chose to enter into time and space and chose to enter and take our flesh. So our co-essence, so to speak, or our co-nature with God is what gives us great joy. We don't have a high priest who's distant from us. We have a high priest who sympathizes with us in all ways, who knows, who feels what we've encountered. When you cry, Jesus wept. When you hunger, he wept. When you thirst, he thirsted. When you are betrayed and ridiculed, he was betrayed and ridiculed. So you don't have a God who's distant. You have a God who's very close. And that's the greatest joy and depth that he is a genuine human being, not some phantom or bodiless apparition. That he is the one, he is one of us and forever united to us through his humanity. And devotion to Mary also becomes understandable. For she is the one who gave him his human nature, his flesh and blood. She is the one through whom Christ can always call himself the Son of Man. Do you guys catch that? Like his divinity was in all times and in all places. There never was a moment where God was and Christ wasn't, right? Like, there are a lot of heresies that came out in the early church that said that Christ was became God later. No, the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? But when God, when the Word chose and took flesh, he took flesh and his human nature from who? From St. Mary. So our greatest joy is the fact that he shares our essence. He shares our fabric. He shares our humanity. And who did he get that humanity from? St. Mary. So you see why it's, not in, it's intrinsically connected? It's not this like, oh, St. Mary is like just another person. No, she's a big deal because he chose to take this woman as the woman that he was going to take his flesh from. Are you following me or did I confuse you all? I'm trying to take this complex theological topic and make it a little bit simpler. Look what St. Athanasius says. He says, Christ is born of the Father, but took his humanity from the unplowed earth, ever virgin and theotokos. He took his humanity from St. Mary. So, you understand why she's a big deal? You get it? Make sense? But here's the starting point that I think for us we need to get. The image of God when we, we were created, he said, let us create man in our image and likeness. And God created man in his image, in his image right? Genesis chapter 3, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, pardon me. The image of God is stamped in us. And you see this picture on the right? It's a clear picture, right? So the image of God initially was crystal clear. You see that picture and you can make out very, very clearly it's a tree. There's nothing distorted about that picture. When death and sin entered into the world, right, the image became what? Blurry, a little bit distorted. The image is still there, but it's not clear, right? The image of God that's stamped in you and I is crystal clear when he created us. But because sin and death entered into the world, the image became blurry. Now let me tell you, there is what we are now, which is blurry, and the reality of what we ought to be, which is crystal clear. And that is the whole Christian journey for every single one of us, is to restore the image and likeness of God back into us through participation in his life. Participation in his life. The only person, the only person, I'll read you this great quote. There's actually only one person whom there is perfect conformity, between what God wanted her to be and what she is. And that is his own mother. The ideal that God had of her, that she is and in the flesh, she is all that was foreseen, planned, and dreamed. The melody of her life is played. Just as it is written, Mary was thought, conceived, and planned as the equal sign between the ideal and history, thought, and reality, hope, and realization. 
St. Mary, there is this ideal, right? And she reached that ideal. She, through the grace of God working in her and her participation, she had all the potential to sin, by the way. She, she had every choice that was available to her to sin. But because of her faithfulness and her participation in the life of the Lord, she chose to be this vessel that was available and ready to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the images that we use of St. Mary is we call St. Mary the Ark of the Covenant. You guys remember the Ark of the Covenant? The Old Testament, to approach the Ark of the Covenant was to approach the Lord God himself. Like, one wouldn't ever come and approach the Ark of the Covenant. It was only for a certain period of time, certain priest during one day of the year. There had to be a rope connected that to him. If he died, they'd pull him out. The Ark of the Covenant was a big deal. The Holy of Holies was a big deal. This was because God could not be contained within a golden box, but rather because God chose the golden box as a place of utmost holiness and divine presence on earth. And you see the Ark of the Covenant, where whenever the nation of Israel would take the Ark of the Covenant, there would be a victory in war because the presence of God was with them. If they left the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Covenant was captured, they would lose. There on that mercy seat, God communed with his people in a powerful, mystical way. Just as the Ark of the Covenant was carefully constructed and prepared by human hands, so too was the new ark carefully prepared. But instead of the preparation of carpenters and goldsmiths, the preparation of the Virgin Mary was her quiet and humble obedience and cooperation with the will of God. You see why she's a big deal? The ark of the covenant, you can't come near. And and if the presence of God fills someone, shouldn't that whole thing be consumed? Like, if St. Mary isn't the perfect person, to be able to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, shouldn't she be all consumed? Like the, for God to dwell in humanity, shouldn't that humanity be totally eaten up alive? Right? You with me? So St. Mary is this Ark of the Covenant that is designed in gold and inside this Ark bears the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And by the way, there's a reason why there's a lot of controversy around this whole idea. There's a lot of controversy around St. Mary. A lot of people don't like a lot of the things that I just said. And I want to clarify a few points for us to be able to walk away with and to be able to really understand why this is, again, such a big deal for us. So the controversy around St. Mary is many people will say, you worship her. You worship her. Again, we don't worship her. There's a big difference between honoring and venerating and worshiping someone. If If we worshipped St. Mary, then we would be totally missing the whole point of the work of salvation, right? If St. Mary was this, like, demigod, if St. Mary was this, like, person that ought to receive worship, then we'd be missing the whole point of the work of salvation. Even St. Mary, in the Magnificat, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit does rejoice in God, what? My Savior. She herself needed a Savior. She herself needed the work of salvation to happen, and she was very glad to be the conduit by which the Lord Jesus Christ entered into our world. So we don't worship her. We honor her and venerate her. Why? Because she was the person that the Lord Jesus Christ took, entered into space and time, and chose to be the ark in which he dwelled in, and chose to be the person who would enter into our world, take his humanity from, and would heal us through the work of salvation. I spoke very fast there. But you see why it's a big deal? Like, if this is the person who God chooses to dwell in, and this is the person by which the work of salvation is going to come through and be part of, that's a big deal. We don't worship her. We honor her. You're a big deal. Like, you're a big deal because through you, the Lord Jesus Christ came and saved me. You with me? So we don't worship her. And let me prove that to you through Scripture. When the angel of the Lord appeared to her in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, what did he say to her? He said, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Blessed are you. He doesn't say like, oh, you're cool, or like, thank you. He says, blessed, tubak, like, blessed are you. Like, like you are, (laughs) 
You are chosen among women. You are the perfect person in the perfect time that God entered into our time and space. And then even look what Luke chapter 1, verses 41 to 42. This is crystal clear. And it happened when, the, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was what? What have I been talking about with you guys a lot? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice this. So she's filled with the Holy Spirit, and what comes out of her mouth? Pay attention to this. And then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. She could have just cut out that whole first part and just said, blessed is the fruit of your womb, right? When the Spirit spoke on her lips, he says, blessed are you and blessed is the fruit of your womb. He could have easily just discounted St. Mary and said, you are pretty, St. Elizabeth could have easily just said, the the fruit of your womb is pretty great, St. Mary. No, he says, blessed are you and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So many people will say, well, you give her too much focus. You give her way too much focus. You know, you're doing this week of fasting. You have a a week of veneration and praises. You give her way too much focus. If we go back the last 20 minutes as I've been talking, if she's not there, if she's not part of the story of salvation, if she's not the thought that God has in the beginning when creating the world, then okay, she's not a big deal. But if she is... If she's part of the work of salvation, then absolutely she's a big deal. The angel says she's a big deal. The Holy Spirit through the mouth of St. Elizabeth says she's a big deal. So who am I to say she's not? And in fact, in fact, let me prove this to you. For 1,500 years of Christianity, before the Protestant Reformation, even the Protestant reformers believed the same thing. For 1,500 years of Christianity, Christians believed that St. Mary was a big deal. And even Martin Luther, who was the one who started the Protestant Reformation, look what he says. She is the highest and the noblest gem in Christianity after Christ. She is nobility, wisdom, holiness personified. We can never honor her, what? Enough. But still, honor and praise must be given to her in such a way as not to neither injure Christ nor the scriptures. There are quotes after quotes after quotes of Martin Luther talking about how much he honors and he reveres. And even the early Protestant reformers had this understanding crystal clear that St. Mary was a big deal in the work of salvation. So the modern context of Christians say, oh, y'all are, are pagans, y'all are worshiping this woman. No, 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 no. We're not, we're, we're not worshiping her. We are thanking God for his work of salvation through the life of St. Mary that he took his humanity from her and that he shares in our humanity through her. And here's the thing. I love this quote from, Saint, from Father Alexander Schmemann. He says, Can our love for Christ and our faith in him be so lukewarm as to have no feeling for what took place when she gave birth, that we have no feeling for the one whose purpose in life was to be his mother? If we believe in the absolute divine uniqueness of Christ and his work, then how can we not focus our inner spiritual sight on the woman who gave him his human life? In other words, all veneration of the mother of God, our love for her, our, all our knowledge of her, is a gift that comes solely through personal experience as the fruit of love. Can you love someone without loving their mom? Like, can, like the woman who took care of him, the woman who nursed him, you know when you go to, you go to Jerusalem, there is a church uh, called St. Mary's Grotto. And it's right in, Na- in Bethlehem, right next to the Church of, of the, of the Annunciation, not Church of the Annunciation, the Church of the Nativity, right next door. And it's the place that they say St. Mary nursed the Lord, and that from there some of her breast milk fell, and that breast milk was able to heal people, that anyone who came to that specific area where the breast milk fell healed people. I just want us to fathom this for a second. This woman takes care of the God of the universe. This woman nurses the God of the universe. This woman potty trains the God of the universe. This woman cares for him, takes care of him, raises him up, and teaches him. I don't want to discount St. Joseph the carpenter. Don't discount him. He's a big deal, too. I spoke about him in early on last year when we did a, a series on the hidden gems of the nativity. But St. Mary is a big deal. She's the one, anyone who knows a mom, like, you can insult anyone. You mess with my mama? 
You don't mess with my mama. I love my mama. You don't mess with my mama. You can insult anyone. You don't insult my mother. My mother is the one who took care of me. My mother is the one who gave birth to me. Every person has a special place in their heart for their mom. Right? And yeah, we may com- have conflict with our moms, but we love our moms. How much more could we be so lukewarm as to totally not care at all about the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ? How could, lukewarm could we be about caring about the mother of God, the mother of God who took his, he took his humanity from her? I like this, but it doesn't come through somebody telling you. It doesn't come through somebody telling you. It's not like I'm going to give this talk today and you're going to be like, oh, St. Mary, I love you so much. Like, you're cool. No, it comes through personal experience. It comes through having a relationship with her. Now, people will say, well, how do you have a relationship with someone who is dead? Many of, the, many of our brothers and sisters in the evangelical traditions will say, why do you guys pray to dead people? Let's dissect that for a second. In Christianity, do we believe in death? We don't believe in death, right? We will say, there is no death for your servant, but rather a departure. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. There's no death for Christians. There is no death. There is a momentary departure to a place far greater, right? So we don't pray to dead people. We believe that the saints are alive and they're very much active and they interact with us and we have relationships with them. And if I ask you to pray for me, who am I not to ask Pope Carlos or St. Mary or Abu Dhabi Kamla, my intercessor Abu Dhabi Kamla and Pope Carlos? Who am I not to ask for their prayers and their help? If I believe that they're alive and I don't believe in death, then they're my friends. They are the ones that I'm going to go to for support. Hey, and, and you'll, what's actually kind of crazy is it's easily spoken about, but unless you experience it, like it's, it's just words, right? Unless you have... A, a, a intimate relationship with someone as a friend, it's easy to talk about that relationship theoretically. I have friends that when I go to them and I know that they are p- going to pray for me, there's something about their prayers. The prayers of the righteous man avails much, right? Like I know if certain people pray for me. I'm like, I know if my grandma prays for me, Tita, you got you to gotta pray for me because I know her prayers avail much because she's a very sincere, God-fearing woman. And how much more those who've surpassed on to the place in which they are at before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, how much more should we ask for their prayers? How much more should we ask them to help us and to support us and to encourage us and to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ? And even scripturally, who did the hosts of the wedding of Cain and Galilee go to when they were asking for some help? They went to St. Mary and they said, can you do something about this? And she goes and she intercedes on their behalf, and ask the Lord to convert the water into wine. But let's connect this to us. We are to be St. Mary. Remember I said the image distorted, the blurry image? The goal of us is to be this crystal clear image. We are St. Mary. St. Jerome says this. He says, like the blessed Mary, who was of such purity that she deserved to be the mother of God, you too can be a mother of the Lord. You too can be a mother of the Lord. It seems controversial, right? Like, are we going to be the Theotokos? Are we going to be... We may not be the Theotokos, but we could be the Christophoros. We could be the ones who carry the Lord Jesus Christ. We could be the ones who are ambassadors of him every single place that we go to. We could be the ones whom the Lord enters into. And, and by the way, isn't that what we do in the Eucharist? We are filled with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are filled with the wholeness of the, full, the, the, the totality of the Holy Trinity that we are to receive God and go out and to be light to the world and city on a hill. Is that not the whole goal of the Christian journey or is it just something that we do? We just go and we take communion. Oh, cool. Thank you, Abuna. You gave me a small piece or you gave me a big piece. Oh, thank you, Abuna. You, you, know, you are a little bit stingy on the, on the wine today or the blood today. Oh, Abuna, you, you know, Abuna, your sermon was a little bit too long today or was a little bit too, too annoying today. Like, no, you're coming and you're receiving the fullness of the totality of the Godhead. And that totality of the Godhead should send you out as power into the world should send you out as ambassadors of peace, should send you out as mothers of the Lord, that you receive something so holy, something so special, something so powerful, and you care for it. You know, like, people make fun of, sometimes Coptic people, about how, like, intense they are about when they take communion. 
like, don't brush your teeth, like, don't go in the pool, don't go all these different things. And I used to think, like, of course, some of those things are really funny. Like, if you get a cut, make sure, like, you immediately, like, suck it out, the blood, because God forbid, like, like the, the Jesus is going to exit into, like, a Band-Aid. Like, I'm not making fun of it. I'm not. I'm not. I actually, I actually think those things are not, they're a sign of reverence. Like, we make fun of those things. Our grandmas, my mom used to always say, like, the craziest things. Like, it used to drive me crazy. Like, mom, is, is literally, if I drink water and I backwash, is now Jesus in my water bottle? Don't backwash, Habibi. Don't backwash. Don't backwash. How together? No, but there is a reverence that the, like, the, the people who fully understand what they are re- re- receiving and what they are to sort of do to care for. Like how many of us take communion? And when we take communion, it's just another day in the life. But how many of us care for this baby, this Jesus that we receive? How many of us care for him and we want him to be well taken care of, to be protected, and for me to understand the gravity of him who dwells in me? That's powerful. If he dwells in me, what am I supposed to do in the world around me? What's my life supposed to look like? She's our mama. At the end of the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, when he was on the cross, what did he do? He said to to St. John, he said, St. John, behold your mother. Now you can take that as he's just like passing over his responsibility as the man in Jewish tradition to take care of his mom since St. Joseph was dead, that he passed her or he he, he traveled to the next place that he was taking his responsibility and passing it over to another person. But many of the fathers of the church see that much differently. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, John, standing by the cross, he entrusted him with her care, and he also established a new spiritual relationship between them saying, Behold your mother. In making this statement, Christ makes the Theotokos the mother of all of his disciples. In other words, the mother of all Christians. And what better way to show a mother your love than to honor her for the role she played in your salvation? What better way to honor her? She's your mama. She's your mama. And those who've encountered her as her, your, her mama knows the power of St. Mary and knows the relationship that you can have with her if you choose to tap into it. Listen, are you, not going to, are you not a Christian if you don't believe that St. Mary's a big deal? You are a Christian, but you're missing out on a whole beautiful relationship that's available to you. And you're, miss out, you're missing out and misunderstanding the work of salvation that came through St. Mary. And you're missing out on the person who Christ took his humanity from. So if you choose to not have a relationship with St. Mary, totally fine. Totally fine. That's your prerogative but you're missing out. You're missing out on a mama. You're missing out on having a relationship with somebody who has your back. And you can see that if you go to any of the churches outside of the United States, if you travel anywhere in the world, you go to Italy, you go, people have intense relationships with St. Mary because again, for 1,500 years of Christianity, everybody understood that St. Mary was a big deal. So here we are now in 2024, we wanna think that we are smarter than 1,500 years of tradition of the church. And what I want us to know is we don't worship her, we honor her. We don't make, give, give her too much praise, but if you look at all of the hymns in our church, all of the hymns in our church talk about the story of salvation that happened through her. You can't talk about Saint, salvation without talking about St. Mary. Fair? So over this next week, I would encourage you guys, I would encourage you guys, we have every night from Tuesday Till the following Tuesday, we have a service that's going to be going on. We're going to be venerating St. Mary. We're going to be singing hymns, connecting us to the Lord Jesus Christ and talking about the work of salvation through St. Mary. And we are going to have a spiritual word from one of the fathers of the local area. And some people are traveling, some from North Carolina and some from Richmond, some from Egypt. And it's a really great opportunity for us to really have a week of divine visitation. We all want to be little St. Mary's. We all want to be ones who carry the Lord Jesus Christ, and we all want to be ones who hold her and hold him dear in our heart in order for us to be ambassadors of peace. She is our mama, 
and she wants to be your mama. And she does. And if you allow her, your benefit. If you don't allow her, your prerogative. Glory be to God forever. Amen. <coughs>